everyone. I'm going to call the work session on May 8, 2023 to order. We're going to begin with our first item on the agenda, mural guidelines for the city. This is just going to be a brief introduction, and we're hoping to spend a little more time with you all on this in June, potentially at your next work session. Um, these mural guidelines um, have been established. They're draft at this point in response to citizen interest in having murals in Madison. Uh, we're recommending allowing murals in commercial districts. Uh, you may want to also give consideration to allowing murals on city property. The draft guidelines that you have right now do not include that provision, but you may want to think about that. Um, just in general, in terms of some of the highlights of these draft mural guidelines, uh, we're recommending no more than two murals per building. Um, they would need to be located on the sides or rear of buildings, except for and mixed-use buildings in D1. Um, there's consideration to allow them on the front of the building. So an example of that would be the Avenue building downtown. Uh, which is a fairly long expanse. Um, there's an interest in putting a mural there, but there's really no side or rear that would work um, for them. So building in some consideration for that. Uh, we're recommending the creation of a mural advisory board. There's ones that would take action on the murals. It would be a five-member board appointed by the council. Uh, for murals that might be proposed in the historic district, um, once the mural advisory board took action, then it would have to go to the historic district. So the historic um, commission already has um, guidelines and regulations regarding murals for the historic district in place. We're not looking to supersede those or upend those. So the historic preservation commission would still have final say, if you will, on any murals in the historic area. Um, we've built in language in here to require an application. There's a filing fee. Ultimately, an installation permit would be needed. Um, as part of their materials that they would have to submit, they would need to submit schematic design. They'd also need to submit a maintenance plan. And the murals would be checked. Um, we're recommending twice a year, you know, after spring and winter, to make sure that the murals are still in good um, order. And Again, these are draft guidelines. There's a lot more detail in there, um, but to keep this brief so we can focus on the main topics of the work session, um, I just wanted to introduce this. Uh, what we're looking for the council to do is to review this, um, and you can either email staff with questions before we all assemble again to discuss this, um, you know, submit suggestions over to us, and then we'll work out if we come back for a work session. Happy to answer any preliminary questions at this time if you have them. So do you anticipate us then discussing it further at a work session before it actually coming to the council for a vote? I do. I, I think it's um, significant enough. Of, you know, we, we don't have any mural program guidelines in Madison. Um, there are a number of cities that allow murals that also don't have guidelines, and they just sort of wing it. Um, that's not really our style. <laughs> So um, we'd rather um, have some guidelines in place and, and spend a little time discussing it with you all. Mm -hmm. And I guess we could look to Hunt, we could look to Huntsville to see how they do theirs. They, they do not have any guidelines. They're one of the communities that wing it. Yeah. Even though they have several murals, there are no guidelines. Wow, that's surprising. There's nothing adopted. Okay. Um, there may be some informal guidance, mm -hmm. but there's nothing that they've adopted. So staff, um, Kaylee Zimmerman, who is in our planning department, uh, worked on this and um, spent a lot of time reviewing um, various cities who have adopted guidelines. And um, one of the other aspects that I didn't touch on is legal considerations. And you'll find in your summary a brief um, paragraph, kind of very broad scope on legal, which I conferred with Brian on. And there is a lot of case law in terms of um, free speech, First Amendment rights. And um, so there's very little in the way of um, content regulation um, that the city can do for a mural that would be installed on private property. If it's a mural that's allowed on public property, let's say in a building in Dublin Park, for example, you all can regulate that content. Um, but if it's something that got put on the side of a commercial building, you would not be able to regulate that content except that um, there is uh, definitely case law that um, 
speaks to obscenity and not allowing obscenity. Um, but in terms of, you know, what got included in the mural, um, that that is severely restricted by the courts in terms of what you all can do. So that's something that I think we would dive into a little bit more in a work session. Uh, Brian's been given a copy of these. He's going to be looking at it as, all, as well just to make sure that it passes legal muster or it would. Um, but you may, some of you may recall in 2018, the city adopted um, the updated sign guidelines, and that was in response to the Supreme Court decision, um, Gilbert versus Reed, in which the Supreme Court ruled that cities could not effectively regulate content. And so um, we went through and updated our sign regulations uh, in 2018 in response to that Supreme Court case. So we feel really comfortable with our sign or regulations. We want to make sure any mural guidelines that you would adopt would also pass any kind of legal muster. If we put this on the agenda for the June work session, would that meet the timeline that you're trying to? Yes, that would that would be fine. We know of uh, one group that's looking to try and do a mural, but realistically that might happen in the fall. Um, we're not expecting to be inundated with requests for these, but we have from time to time gotten requests people who would like to do them and, and currently except for in our downtown, you know, our answer is they're not allowed. Anybody else have any questions? All right. Thank you, Mary Beth. Thank you. Okay. And next we have a science museum proposal. Uh, Cooper, are you going to introduce this? So thanks for having the work session tonight so we can talk about this. All I'm looking for tonight, we'd just like to share some information with you guys to see if this is something you guys would like to pursue. Uh, I'm not asking for approval of the museum. I'm not asking for anything other than a head nod to allow Mayor and I to negotiate with uh, Joe and his team to uh, bring them on board and provide Madison City a science museum. So a little bit about Joe. Uh, he's been a teacher. He's been, uh, he's been in marketing. He's worked with uh, Make-A-Wish. And United Way, he's been a lobbyist. He's been on the Special Senate Banking Subcommittee that was tasked with fixing the savings and loan crisis of 1989. He uh, created a, a children's magazine for dinosaurs. He's worked with Universal Pictures with the Jurassic Park Institute, a program that was used by over 35,000 uh, teachers and 22 million students and their families. He went on to create museum exhibits and displays around the world co produced an award winning documentary and he's found at three science festivals in collaboration with the MIT Science Festival Alliance. And this includes the Alabama Science Festival that uh, recently drew 7,200 members over at the Von Braun Civic Center that uh, Huntsville and Madison supported. So he's got the experience. He came to us about a year ago looking for space. At first, we didn't have any space for him, but then once we purchased Hexagon, we figured we'd make, make some space for him. I'd just like for him to present his information, his vision, and then uh, let you guys ask some questions, and then we'll just kind of go from there. So, go. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, for giving me the opportunity to chat a little bit about this. Um, people ask me, quick anecdote, why do I want to do this? What, what drives me to do museum exhibits, do the Alabama Science Festival. We're a nonprofit. I don't really make anything from it. Um, I play with model trains in my downtime. But about 10 years ago, um, I was living in one of the poorest communities in the United States, in the very south part of the big island of Hawaii. And I was working with the science festival there that I started. And um, the University of Hawaii said, hey, we can, we're doing this program up on the slopes of Mauna Kea, and we're going to help reforest, and we're tagging some birds. And they have critically endangered bird species there. The, uh, most of the native species are going extinct. So we found 10 kids from the local school there. We took them on a three-day program that the university paid for. They got to plant trees that were going extinct. They got to catch in little nets um, endangered species of birds, hold them in their hands after they were tagged and release them. On the way up there, we had this old rickety 15 passenger van. The kids were complaining about, you know, hey, you know, this is our, my mom made me do this. On the way back, 
they were all talking about how do I learn more about this? How do I become a scientist? We literally had kids say, I want to be a scientist. These were kids who had no exposure to this kind of thing. That's why I do what we're doing here. When I see the thousands of families at the science festival here, I can see the need and the hunger for this kind of a, a science museum, one that this community is really the one that should have it. And um, so when I've been talking to Mayor Finley in his office about this, I thought this is the perfect location. Um, let's see. Turned on. Sometimes you got to turn the thing. Oh, oh, there we go. That helps. Okay, so <clears throat> we want to bring a museum that does everything about science. We're not going to compete with the Space and Rocket Center. They do what they do better than any place else on the planet. But there's a lot of science besides that. So um, what we want to do is create a museum that inspires. We want to have people come to the museum and see science presented, science facts, science ideas, not all science is settled science, and let them, be, you know, show them creative thinking, critical thinking on how a scientist works. To be a, a, a true center piece for immersive science and education here in Madison, your city is growing like crazy. Most museums in this size community can draw anywhere from 100,000 to 300,000 people a year. And a lot of those will be out of state visitors who come through and will get spillover from Huntsville. But a lot of people will make this a destination. The best example I can give you is in the very small community of Drumheller, Canada in Alberta. The city itself is 8,000 people. They got about 20,000 visitors. Then they built the um, Badlands Dinosaur Museum there. They now average 350 to 400,000 visitors a year in this little tiny city. It's been a huge boom. These are some of the sciences that we'll cover. Um, we've got Dr. or actually Professor Hoaxbergen from UAH, who is also the base archaeologist for Redstone Arsenal. He's an Army employee, and he does archaeology. They just logged in their 1,000th archaeological site on the arsenal, and he has to send most of his artifacts far away, hours away, to a federal repository. He's already applied for us to have repository status. So we'll be able to house at the Madison Science Museum local artifacts that people can't simply can't see. And it's amazing stuff. Um, I don't know how many of you know that we had saber-toothed cats and giant ground sloths roaming around right here 13, 14,000 years ago. We will adopt a public museum model where we will have a suggested admission, but we do not exclude anybody. And these types of models, most people will pay. Only 10 to 15 percent will ask for a reduced fee or a free admission, and that's fine because everything has to be accessible. <clears throat> this is the proposed location. You know the site, and it's ideal for what we want to do to start out with. Ideally, you'll see how incredibly successful we are, and we can find a permanent location down the road. Our exhibit halls are going to be amazing for such a small space, and this is where some of my experience comes in. I learned museum exhibit design from theme park attraction designers working at Universal. So I know how to make things immersive, how to draw visitors in, make them want to learn and learn more about what they're seeing. And then we'll have, we'll extend that museum experience outside through web-based programs that we'll have. And this is my experience directly with the Universal Pictures Jurassic Park Institute, where we had so many millions and millions of people using our materials. Um, it'll all be free. It will all be designed to um, Alabama state standards, whether it's science, math, or English language arts. We've already secured, and this is again, I got a lot of political capital from managing the Jurassic Foundation at Universal Pictures, where we gave out a couple million dollars to young scientists, mostly grad students, 
and we funded their field research. Now they're all running museums and university programs. And this is a great example of one. We are getting a real triceratops skeleton for the museum. It's about a 25-footer. Um, I specifically asked for this dinosaur if we could find one because we don't have high ceilings in this building and this will fit. It's about 10 feet at its tallest. But this would be a multi-million dollar acquisition for many museums. We're getting it for just the cost of shipping and mounting it. And then we'll also have, if we get a permanent facility with taller ceilings, a T-Rex skeleton. Um, it's, uh, it's an incredible specimen. Um, the mural you see there is the actual wall. The, this hall will be small. It'll only be about 1,500 square feet because of the limitations of the space in the building over there. But the mural uh, was created as a oval. So you enter through a door that's in the dark part of the mural and you're surrounded by the wall. The wall's interactive, uh, meaning that there will be screens that visitors can move around and it will tell them what they're seeing behind it. You know, they can put it on a plant or a, a dinosaur or some other animal that's in the mural, and it'll have um, animations and information for the visitors. And this artist has done uh, the new dinosaur hall illustrations at the Smithsonian Museum. He's done them for the, um, uh, the Houston Museum of Natural Science, where I did a big exhibit about a dinosaur. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of a dinosaur geek. <laughs> But um, so we're really uh, fortunate to have, I already have that mural, and uh, that won't be a cost other than printing for it. The benefits of a museum to a community are legion. It creates millions of dollars in revenue into the community. Um, 100,000 visitors a year will tend to spend, on average, in the community about $30. On, uh, each, and that's in dining and shopping and, and the, um, other things. So most visitors who travel more than 30 minutes will go to local shops and restaurants. We estimate, and I think this is a very conservative estimate, that in year one, we'll get half a million dollars in local revenues, and then by year five, millions of dollars. Second tier is obviously people discover, my wife and I found J. Alexander's. <laughs> and we've gone back there a number of times just for their key lime pie. But um, it's, uh, you know, people find things that they didn't know existed. And that's a wonderful benefit of having a museum. It is a destination. Um, this is really important because, again, this speaks to our team. Now, we've got a NASA scientist there. And he works with, Eli works with the uh, IMPACT program, which is an earth sciences program that is often overlooked because they're not firing rockets and spacemen up. And they are committed to working with us. We've got wonderful letters of commitment to them working with us. And we will have, because of their profile in the international community for climate and environment, we'll have a uh, annual program here that will draw, I'm certain, many hundreds, if not upwards of a thousand scientists and researchers to Madison for these programs that will be hosted out of the museum. Obviously, we won't squeeze everybody into the actual space. We'll use other uh, venues around Madison for that. Um, and these types of attendees spend significant money, and that's, a, again, a very conservative estimate of $407 a day on average, two and a half days for each program. This is a really cool thing. Because of the Science Festival, because of the relationships we've developed, uh, the Missile Defense Agency has been a big supporter of ours. They've already said they will build out two classrooms uh, in this space. And the really important part is they will co-write, um, our attorney who's here today, will um, is drafting an MOU with the Missile Defense Agency to um, co-write grants for us to tap into DOD money that's for STEM learning and STEM programs. We'll have a lot of field trips for the community. We'll have some that are that will be a little bit more for members of the museum, people who want to join and have, might have a little more money to spend, like going to 
we've got one planned for India and Antarctica and Wyoming to dig dinosaurs. But um, we anticipate, on average, about a third of the Madison City School students would visit the museum every year. And it may be a little bit more, especially in the early couple of years, as teachers see the benefits to this. And again, because we will have um, materials that are aligned to state standards, the teachers can use them in the classroom more effectively, and the administrators won't wonder if they're wasting time going to these programs. Um, there's a lot of private and homeschool students in the community, and we will reach out to them. We've, Again, because of the Science Festival, we've got inroads into those types of groups. And then all the other school districts. Uh, we work now with Decatur, with Huntsville City, and Madison County Schools as well. Um, we will have, like I said, we'll have two classrooms. We'll have um, afternoon and weekend programs and summer programs for kids and families. Uh, most of them will probably be in the in the building, but we'll also reach out to the schools. Uh, these are programs I've helped develop, like with uh, the L.A. County Museum, where they had a van that we built for them when I was at Universal that went to schools that couldn't get their kids in. And we do anticipate grant monies that will pay for transportation to the museum for school kids. <coughs> um, we have great relationship with UAH. I've met with Dr. Carr, the president of the university. He's pledged his support. He's actually inundated me with department heads who want to participate in providing content for the museum and programs for the museum. Um, the library has an incredible archive, and they said, oh, yeah, we'll rotate things out. And keeping content fresh in a museum is important because it keeps people coming back. So every 12 weeks, you always have something new for people to come and see. So most museums get some kind of municipal support, but only 56% get actual cash money from the municipalities. Most museums, um, like the one I worked with in Las Vegas, they got their facility for a dollar a year and no other support from the city of Las Vegas, and it worked out great for them. They had an old, in fact, it was the old city hall building in Las Vegas, and they started with a bunch of stuffed animals. <laughs> Museums are a huge contributor to economies all around the, the world, and especially in the United States. Um, lots of tax revenues from museums. Museums create jobs. We anticipate anywhere from 15 to 20 full-time jobs within the first year. The public overwhelmingly supports museums. Everybody thinks a museum is a good thing to have in the community, and they look at it very highly. Most people believe it contributes economically, and 96%, these are all, by the way, the studies are, are referenced there that these come from. This is all historical data that's been, been collected for over decades that um, People think people, that legislators who support museums are great people. So these are some of the people that we, the partners, I talked about the NASA symposium already. Um, They're very excited to work with us. The other conferences and seminars we'll have, um, going to the Indus Valley in India, we're planning that in the um, spring of 2024. Um, I'm sorry, no, the spring of 2024, we've already got a partnership scheduled with the University of Arkansas because that is when, on April 24th, we'll have a full eclipse, and that's one of the locations where it'll be in totality for over two minutes. So we're going to try and get people there. These are some of the companies and organizations that are already expressing incredible support for what we're doing. They're chopping at the bit. I've kind of got them on a rein almost to, you know, tell them, wait, you know, we have steps to do before we move forward too much. But these are all organizations that I've worked with and that really want to see this happen. And I think it will be great to have them participating in something here in Madison and, um, you know, having programs and 
uh, that they can come to and be appreciated for their contributions to the museum. And there's our sources, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Is this the first museum you've ever started from scratch? Um, I helped start two very small museums, one in St. George, Utah, and one in Montana. I was not the founder, but the one in Utah, um, a friend of mine who's a Utah State paleontologist, Dr. Jim Kirkland, approached me and said, I know you were a lobbyist, and can you help us get some federal money? And I went to Senator Orrin Hatch um, and uh, said, hey, you know, we're in your state. This is a great thing. And he got a half a million dollars for the facility. It was a $1.5 million budget at the time. And then there's a very small one that's essentially in a Quonset hut in uh, the metropolitan area of almost 2,000 people in Malta, Montana. Mm -hmm. When you talk about we, what exactly is we? What is your nonprofit organization? The nonprofit is the Innovation for Education Foundation. It's a Alabama registered 501c3. Um, we've been in existence since 2016. And um, I moved here in 2018 when the volcano went off too close to our home in Hawaii and I domesticated it. And then our team, our founding team, we've got two of them here, Ben and Eli, and then we've got other people who I didn't want to just fill up, but you know, there's a, um, a lot of people who are I'm considering founding members of this and will be on the board, the governing board. We will set up, by the way, if it's approved, we'll set up a separate nonprofit for the Madison Science Museum Foundation. So the nonprofit that would actually operate this particular museum has yet to be created? Um, right now, our foundation, there is a nonprofit operating it, and we would transfer its operations once we file. Yeah. We had a long line stretching outside the dinosaur earth area. Again, it speaks to the absolute desire for this kind of informal science education. That um, we had, again, 7,300 and over 30,000 people, students participating in different uh, events around the science festival. We distributed, I think, 10,000 uh, postcards to space uh, that uh, through the Madison City Schools, and I think it was your missus who helped with that. Mm, no. <laughs> um, can I pull on this thread that you started in one of your slides? You talked about. I'm sorry. Yeah, probably. Yeah, maybe so. 
You had on a slide that 56% of these museums re receive support from municipalities. So, and I, I've expressed this to you before when we discussed this earlier, I have a concern about the sustainability of a museum in this area uh, in terms of the financial support that would be necessary for a city to house a museum like this. And even if this is a nationwide statistic, I can only look to museums in this area in terms of the financial support that they require from a municipality. For example, let's look at Huntsville. And you're, you're trying to draw on a lot of the same resources that support a number of museums in the city of Huntsville. So when I looked at their last budget package and I looked at how much Huntsville has to support their own museums to be able to be viable, that the museums still charge, they have field trips, they do all of these things, but they can't survive just on that. And so I looked at the budget and I looked at Huntsville's last year's budget paying $700,000 for early works. $450,000 for Burrett Museum. Um, the Whedon House Museum got $40,000. The U.S. Space and Rocket Center got $325,000. The Huntsville Museum of Art got $725,000. And I think all of those are great museums that also have local support from local companies and donors and yet they still required that type of level of support. So how do you see Madison being able to house a museum like this long term? Um, well, again, I, that number is 56% is what you're saying, which is direct cash. It's your slide. Right, I know, that's, that's direct cash. 56% get direct cash contributions in addition to things like facilities. Like I said, the one in Las Vegas, they get a facility and that's the only municipal support. And you think, well, Las Vegas is big, but it's not a science community. This is a science community. And so um, I, I, that, you know, from that regard, the fact that they can stay in business is, you know, incredible. And I worked with them closely. I know how they do it. Um, they're not a fancy, you know, like you talked about the Museum of Art here. That building is incredible. I can't imagine what it costs to build it and maintain it. We're not asking for that, uh, for especially initially. And if we were to move forward with the permanent building, um, I firmly know that we will be able to raise monies so it would not become a burden <laughs> on the city. I know how we can structure it to run lean, especially in this, if we are, you know, the proposed location here. I know that it will uh, not cost that much to build it and to operate it. And, um, you know, we're playing with budget numbers right now, and I know that it's absolutely in the realm of what we will be able to raise to keep this going for the foreseeable future. So I think that the economic benefit to the city will be enormous and the drain on the city will be almost nothing. Um, Ma'am, I don't think anyone can hear you. Um, we might need to get a microphone because we have people watching a live stream and we're trying to record. So if we could get her a microphone, that might help so that we could. <laughs> um, I don't know how many of you have been able to go to the uh, STEAM Fest science festival that we've had at the Von Braun Center. Were you able to make it with kids or anything? Or I was hosting a chess tournament that day. So okay, I, all right. There. But, um, I am familiar with it. So three years in a row, we, we have had fantastic support, and it's continued support. It's, it's, you know, every year it's the same support. It's consistent support, and um, it's growing every year. This year, I I think we're going to go probably to 12,000 people is what I would anticipate. And there's more and more companies that want to participate. And in the first year, even with COVID, where everybody was struggling, I mean, Joe didn't even think twice. He was so quick to be able to change and, and do it online. And he got all these scientists that he was working with, and he had them um, 
keep, we handed out what, 2,000 science kits? in 4,000. 4,000 science kits through the Boys and Girls Club, through the uh, library. So we have fantastic uh, relationship with those and some of the schools and everything. And we handed out science kits. And then the kids were able to go online and work with the scientists at a certain time to do their science kits and ask any questions that they want and um, whatever. But I, you know, to the kind of support, I, as you saw on the last page, the supporters that we do have, they are all in for the museum too. So, and that's only going up. That's, that's more and more people want to participate every day. So that was just what I wanted to add to that. Thank you. Thank you. My wife's a very ardent supporter <laughs> of this, and, and she's a lifelong educator. She's been an award-winning teacher and a principal, um, so she knows uh, what she talks about when it comes to inspiring kids. But anyway, um, so. Council, do you have other questions? I'm sorry, I'm trying not to. I just wanted to ask, so just to confirm, you're not asking for any financial support. You just need temporary housing. The facility, yes. The facility, and, and I wanted to ask either the mayor or president or the chiefs that are here, I know that we have plans to put our first responders in that building, and I wanted to make sure that fire and police had the amount of space that they needed so that if we didn't put the science museum there, this space, in effect, would be empty and and nothing would be there. Is that correct? Or it could be leased for some other reason. Please not his head, but I'll say yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you, thank you. That, that was the only question I had. Okay, before when we talked, we had a meeting, and I told you I would want to know business case for this. Is this a viable business? You yes. stated that this is a nonprofit, and I understand it's a nonprofit, but even nonprofits have business cases so that they can explain their viability to investors. Do you have any of those numbers or data for us to look at? Not today. Um, I do have projections. For example, we anticipate $600,000 in um, admission revenues. We anticipate about another $250,000 in um, revenues from field programs and expeditions. That's after you exist. In order to get to the point where you do exist, there is capital outlay. Correct. When the Cook's Museum started, the first thing that happened was the Cook family gave $5 million to the museum as an initial capital outlay so that they would have money to buy paint, light bulbs, hire people to hang murals, all of those things. Those things all have to happen before the first admission is paid. Our initial budget to build the museum out on the inside is about $1.5 million. Where does that money come from? Um, a lot of those companies and organizations you saw up there uh, are literally asking me, when can we begin to give money and how much will you need? And on some out of them right here, NASA says, NASA can't provide direct financial support. Correct. One of the letters that you have in your packet. How many of those names up there have told you, I will write you a check, not I will support you? Because I will support you all day long, but you're not getting a dime. I mean, those... <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Sure. No, Blue Origin, um, they support us, our science festival, through the um, their nonprofit, the Club for the Future. Uh, or I've talked with Larry Powell, who's one of the directors here um, for Blue Origin, and he is working with us for a significant investment from Blue Origin themselves, not their nonprofit. I also have a really great friend who just became a executive with Amazon who's going to pressure the boss there to give even more for the museum startup. Um, we have the Missile Defense Agency. We're going to fast track grant monies for that. That can happen within a matter of months that we would have significant dollars. And that is potentially millions 
the, the grants for the, that are available through the Department of Defense programs are incredible. The same thing with NOAA the, the, and the National Weather Service. Their grants are in the six to seven figure range. I'm and, familiar and, with all those grants. Right. But you haven't received any of those grants. No, that's the chicken and the egg. So I, I haven't I, even got a I building. Think we're a little bit premature in getting a building when you don't have a plan on how to support that building. And I, this looks wonderful. It looks amazing. But until I can see that you have actually sat down and figured out what the finances are and what the capital outlay is going to be before you can open your doors, I, I can't commit on a hope and a prayer. I can't commit. I need an actionable business plan. That's what I need. Yeah, but what Joe's saying, though, he can't go out and ask for money until he knows he's got some type of agreement for the museum. I mean, he was talking to people earlier. You can get time. a commitment from somebody, a pledge. Okay, but, but he, was talking happens to, all the time. he was talking to people earlier about the potential for the museum, and then word got out, and then he got in trouble because he was talking about the museum that hadn't been approved yet. So... As we work through the, if you guys had not the agreement, as we work through, through the agreement, and we feel like it's going to be passed, then that gives him the ability to go out and provide that, inf get that information, and bring back when we bring the agreement. Okay, here's the agreement. If it passes, Joe's got six companies willing to give two million dollars upon passing. But at this stage right here, he's he is not capable of going out to raise that money. What about like a conditional agreement that you have X number of months to kind of bring us letters of support that say uh, that so you still need a business case. I, and a I agree. Plan. I agree. I agree. You need to know how many employees you're going to need. You need to know. But it all starts with you need to know you've got a facility to do that. So, Not necessarily. Well, so what the agreement would consist of, and all we're, again, all we're asking for is the chance to talk to Joe and his team to come up with a three-year agreement to use the hexagon location. And in that three years, if he does not raise the funds, raise the support to have a standalone building, and the agreement it, you know, it expires. I still have a hard time with the fact that you can't come up with a business case. You can come up with all these detailed drawings of what all of these exhibits will look like. How many people will it take to man this museum? How many employees are you going to need to scrub the toilet? Said 16. All of those things need to be in a business plan. How will you pay for those people? What is your, what are right. your outlays? And, and we talked about, that. hold on, hold on, hold on. We talked about that. I need to go first. <laughs> <laughs> What's your concern with that? So when you say that, I, and I'm trying to understand because I, I hear, I'm listening to you. To get a, it's the chicken and the egg, so if you come together, what, when you don't have a business plan, what's your concern? My concern... It's not going to cost you anything with it with, other than giving him the ability for one, two, three years, whatever, at least to get to that point where he can show you that, to have a go, no-go, kind of like what Maura was saying. So I hear you. Okay, you say <coughs> that it's not going to cost you anything, but that facility and the use of that facility has value. It could be rented to someone else. For some amount of money, so that is value that the city is giving. I understand Tony's concern and, and somewhat agree with it. I mean, what we have right now is a hope and not a plan. And you know, businesses aren't made on hope. Nonprofits aren't made on hope. I mean, it's just that's you know, it's a little difficult to grasp. I'm not saying it's a no, but for me personally. I think it's a no right now because there's some, some really crucial questions that haven't been answered. Who's the curator? Do you have any curator experience? You know, who, who are your, your, you're a curator? Okay. Because, but I mean, have you curated a museum? Okay. What museum? Is it still successful? Those kind of things. And we don't, we don't have any of that. And I understand the chicken of the egg thing, right? I, I got that. But 
I think that's what this presentation, to me, so I haven't, I haven't met with you, and that's kind of what I was looking for in this presentation. Um, and I, I, you know, one of the slides I saw is all the different sciences that are on there. Um, and to me, you know, it's, if, if you're in a business, right, you're in a, if you're in construction business, I may be in the construction business, but I am in the electrical business. And just because I do electrical doesn't mean I'm starting out doing electrical plumbing, you know, and this and that. I mean, you have to focus. And I, I guess for me, that's what I see. So right now I see hope. And well, Keep in mind, too, I mean, Connie raised a lot of these questions when we met. And we, we've got 40 minutes at best tonight to talk about this. So we had to keep things simple, give you that the high view of it, and see if it's something you guys feel like would bring value to our city. And if it is, give us time to negotiate. And while we negotiate, we can get this information. So when it comes back, when the agreement comes to you guys, you've got an agreement. Oh, and here's the commitments that we've received in this, you know, the past several weeks. Well, and at that point, if it's all presented, then and there's a step in between. It sounds like that they've got to have more information. At least they got to this point. You need to collect all of the concerns and questions, give them a chance to put the phase two pieces in place. And then, once we get an approval at that point, we can look to negotiate. And that's what I was hoping for tonight, more information. I mean, getting the concerns that we need to address as we work through with the agreement. Well, and one of mine on the agreement side is, you know, if we if we were to go with this, we're going to three-year agreements, right? Correct. It's, you know, it's free. Um, so do, would, would you be willing to sign up for a 10-year agreement? Three of ours, seven of yours. If you move, you pay all the, the rent back. Sure. I mean, so those are kind of some things that I'm looking if at. If he moves or moves outside Madison. Can you, can if he you, moves outside of Madison. Can okay. you address that part that you talked about in after this three-year period and it's successful, what your plan was in the Madison, town Madison area? Are you able to share that, that idea? So we've got 30 acres around the quarry. Uh, that would be a potential limit spot. No, you're going to move from one city property to another city property. Again, it's it's just potential. That's not planned out. It's potential. They outgrow the current one, and they need more space. Well, that area around the quarry could be perfect because I mean it looks like an architectural dig there, or not architectural, but um, you know. I got one. So I'm just going to go ahead and answer real quick for me. I mean, right now I'm a no because I don't have enough information. I'm not saying I'm a no forever, but the information I have, I won't make a decision of yes. So that's well, again, that's why we've been trying to get you guys so we could provide the information so we could have a... But I asked for the information. I know, and, and I... I haven't received the information. Right. And when Teddy asks a question, you, you listen to him and you take in what he says. And when I ask a question, I feel like you're brushing me off. No, uh, I've heard is that you because not. I'm mean, or you don't like the way I look, or what's going on here? You can't prove that. Mm. No. I can't prove that. No, I can't prove that. I don't know if anything is mean for me. Probably a lot of people would say we, we talked about that, though, and we I think we both agreed that tonight was not the time to present all that information because of our lack of time. Mm. But yeah, I was asked to be brief. Mm. Yes, and brief is overview. different from not addressing at all. I did want to, you know, to Teddy's concern, we have experienced curators, which, like in the Dr. Scott Person, uh, Dr. Ken LaCavera. Um, these are all people who are going to work with us either as full-time curators or helping get the museum up and running at the very beginning. Um, as far as funding goes, um, you know, again, I don't like to write checks can you, can you step to the microphone? So okay, sorry. I don't like to write checks that I can't cash. So if I go to Blue Origin and say I need a commitment for you from something for something that I may or may not have, it could damage my reputation and other programs we're working with them if that falls apart. So um, you know, I really would prefer to have a yes. If you can do this, Joe, you'll get this. And if you can't do this, then it's a no-go. I'm a yes to move forward to the next step that you're requesting. Simple question, Joe. How much money are you going to go out and ask for? A million and a half dollars. One and a half million dollars. Right. And that does what? That will completely build out 
the existing proposed facility at the hexagon building and when i say build out all the exhibit halls the nice thing is as i mentioned we have a lot of stuff we have literally millions of dollars worth of artifacts to put in there and um, while like the nasa letter you pointed out says they're not going to give us money they will give us stuff and they will give us expertise they will give us experts who will be there um, so you know it, it's and then that will also pay for staff initially too for at least six months operating of staff because i have penciled out some numbers i you know, if you ask me for a spreadsheet right now, I've got a couple that are, you know, just ideas that we put together and, and possibilities. We haven't even determined exactly what exhibits will be in there other than what we already have, which is a lot. And the problem that we face is this, if you really look at the big picture, we've got more stuff than we'll ever be able to fit in, you know, 10,000 square feet. And we'll save it someplace to put into the future building that again, I'm certain will be in the position to open in the not too distant future because I'm getting too old to wait too long. <laughs> Don, Karen, you two have not had a chance to speak or ask a question. I'd like to let y'all. Yes, thank you for that. Um, I appreciate your enthusiasm for this. I think it's an excellent addition. You obviously haven't just thought of it. You've been thinking about this for quite some time why you think Madison is a good place to be. I unfortunately wasn't able to attend any of your meetings. Um, and I'm sorry about that. But can you just give me an overview of what size we're even talking about? What type of exhibits, what the floor plan would be like? What the kids would see as they would go through? Just as an overview right now. Okay, when you... Microphone, please. As you saw um, when we had the little round circles of all the different disciplines, scientific disciplines that we'll present, mm -hmm. Um, you walk in through the atrium, and again, Steve was kind enough to allow us to kind of see uh, the building and go through it, and it would all be gutted. It, you'd have a big empty space. Everything we put in there would be um, portable walls that could ultimately be moved because we don't anticipate being there for more than a few years. And um, there's a story that you write for a museum, and that's something I learned in designing exhibits uh, especially, like I said, when I worked at Universal Pictures, we built, a, for example, a 30,000 square foot exhibit that was a story that followed the Jurassic Park films. Um, we will have a story that will integrate all the different things. For example, you go in and, and the, the first hall you go to is the uh, paleontology. You see the dinosaurs, you see all that. You exit that and then you go and you see the lab where we'll have specimens that are being worked on. The lab will also have specimens from the archaeology, uh, which will be the next little hall. And that will have a 30-foot mural that will depict what the arsenal grounds looked like 13,000 years ago when it was an arboreal forest. We'll have a lot of the artifacts that Ben has been uncovering there. Then we'll go from there because that will talk a lot about the environment and how it's changed over time. And that will go into the climate and environment hall. That's where NASA and NOAA are working closely with us to showcase how different Earth environments are now, how they were in the past, and how they're being affected um, and changing for the future. So then you go from that into biology. And, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll talk on biology from the standpoint of just general life on Earth uh, to marine biology. We have Dolphin Island Sea Lab from down on the coast who wants to contribute um, materials and content to the, and we also work with Woods Hole up in Massachusetts to contribute to the marine biology. Then we'll go into things like chemistry, um, and uh, UAH really wants to participate in that, and then technology. Again, it's a small space for a museum, so everything's going to be compact. I want to create a 90-minute experience at a minimum, even if you're kind of casually going through. Some people run through in 30 minutes. Some people will take four or five hours to look at every little detail. And, and if they want to stay longer, the important thing is to present them with more in-depth information about everything we see. And again, that's something I have experience with. So um, do I think we can raise a million and a half dollars in a relatively short period of time? Absolutely. Um, you know, again, because I've done this, I, you know, if you could get in my head, it'd be a scary jumbled up place, but there's a lot of good information in there from the experience I've had. 
if I was, you know, as young as Eli over there, who's a NASA scientist and a lot smarter than I'll ever be, you know, you know, I didn't have all that experience, and that's what one of the things that I'm going to bring to this. And John, you can see it in the science festival. Do you have anything? Incredible success we've had. We've got five minutes left, so John. Yes, I, I mean, I agree with a lot of the folks up here about the business case, just understanding that behind not just the opportunity but the risk it presents to the city. Um, from the standpoint also of understanding there, you know, you've got the Cooks Museum uh, that's out there. You've also got the North Alabama Zoological Society that's looking at, you know, they want to put a zoo, and then they also want to have a marine biology uh, uh, area there. How do you see this facility either partnering or competing with those, and what would be your plan to either take advantage of that or mitigate that? We actually work with the, the Zoological Society, and I hope to God that they'll be able to get together what they're doing. Because in Las Vegas, for example, we worked really closely with the Shark Reef attraction at the Monterey, at the Mandalay Bay um, facility. And their aquarist was our aquarist, and he took care of the live animals there. And I can absolutely see uh, the Zoological Society, even before they're built, and they're many years away, I think, and having a, a zoo, but they do have animals and stuff, and we love when they bring them to our science festival and people get to interact with them and see all that. Sure. Thank you. What kind of timeline are we talking about as far as you putting together a plan and getting together the money and when we need to make decisions? If we can get a head nod from you guys tonight, we would start working on all that information immediately. Uh, timeline. It just depends on how quickly he can get some letters of commitment and uh, come to terms that all of you guys need to see on that agreement. So we wouldn't try to rush it through. We'll take our time. We'll, we'll make sure your needs and your questions are met. We'll make sure the money's met, and then it'll come forward. It may be a month. It may be two months. Okay. So not really tying up the space that somebody else might get just because you're answering questions here. Is that correct? Well, I guess... From my standpoint, the only sense of urgency I have is I like to go and start getting that building designed for our first responders and our fire station. Sure. And I like to, if we're going to move forward with, with the museum, I like to have them kind of take care of their part as we're taking care of our part. And I like to have the same architect do both parts at the same time. I'm a yes going forward. I know, I know they need to meet. It's about 6 o'clock, so we're about out of time. So. We do. We only have two minutes left, and we do need to take a break we'll get before you. we start at 6. Thank you for your time and presenting and for bringing it to us, and we're going to get more information for them and for you and continue to work. All right. Thank you. Or a conclusion one way or the other. Thank you. Much. We're going to adjourn for two minutes.